and uh, now we move on to uh, talk about uh, the reality of being an author in uh, Iceland. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> Does everyone appear on camera? I'm not sure. Do we need to shift down a little bit? How oh, we're good. We're good. Everyone's appearing on camera. Okay. So we have two uh, authors here. We have uh, Margaret Trigvadotter, yeah. who is a writer of children's and adult books. And we have Carl August Ulfsson, who is a, an author, an actor, a comedian. <laughs> Anything else you do? Oh, you're, you're chair of the Writers' Union of, of Iceland? Yes. Okay. So in the restaurant last night, someone, uh, Tina, was telling me that uh, uh, there's 370,000 people in Iceland. Is that correct? Around that? Yes. I immediately translate these things into Canadian. So you have a uh, uh, hundred fewer, hundred times fewer people in Iceland than we have in Canada. And whenever I talk about the Canadian market, I call it tiny, yeah. minuscule. What is Iceland? <laughs> it's a micro, a micro, micro a, a micro economy yeah. for for authors. Can can you talk a little bit about that? How important is it? To, to be an author in, in uh, an economy that is, in a market that is so small. Well, I have a prepared speech, so- Sure, uh, go ahead. I'm, 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 I'm sure there's something As long as that. somewhere in there you touch on my question. Ah, yeah. <laughs> you let me know it comes. <laughs> so, hello. Uh, dear colleagues, it is a true pleasure and honor for me to address you and welcome you to Iceland. The world is a peculiar creature which takes on the most fantastic forms. It can be tough and persevering, but at the same time, sensitive and fragile. The past few years have clearly shown us that forces that our earthly lives depend upon, whether it be microorganisms that threaten to take away our lives and health and render our societies inoperable, ominous changes in the Earth's ecosystems, all the man-made terror presented to us in military hostilities and wars where innocent people are victims first and foremost. I could make a long speech about the role of literature and the arts in the world in question and how artists by nature belong to the team which supports humanity and peace. Still, it's not quite certain that everybody would relate to these ideas, simply because there's no guarantee that all of us apply the same meaning to these words. And possibly some of us would tend to turn their meaning upside down, that is to say, the meaning this particular speaker perceives in them. Of course, it is our unquestionable right to do so, or rather, it should be. Isn't that what we inevitably agree on? Our right to express the different ideas that we believe in. The right to express our thoughts about anything at all, to disagree and communicate our disagreement without harming each other. But it is not my role today to give a philosophical speculation. My task here is to speak about the conditions of writers in Iceland and the role of the organization I represent. The Icelandic Writers' Union is a union of writers, like the name clearly implies. It is our responsibility to negotiate with companies and organizations that employ our members by their work for publication or other kinds of production. Members of the RSI are novelists, poets, writers of children's books, playwrights, screenwriters, translators, and authors of any kind of published material which fills the condition of artistic and cultural value. As a result, the RSI makes wage contracts with book publishers, film production companies, television and radio networks, theaters and other parties that wish to buy literature and make it accessible to the public. On top of that, we make rates of pay when it comes to disbursements from parties we don't make direct contracts with. In Iceland, we are lucky enough to have a system of 
stipends for artists, a system of funds which supports Icelandic culture and sponsors the making of art of various nations. Um, that enables artists, writers among them, to apply for salaries from the Icelandic state to make it possible for them to create their work. This system has gone through quite some changes for the past few years, but authors have had the right to apply for salaries ranging from three months to two years. This has made it possible for a certain group of authors to write and to present their work in multiple forms. However, the wages are not high and reach at best about 67% of the median wage in our country. And then again, it is, of course, a vast minority of writers that enjoy the mercy of the allotment committees, which distribute the money. Just about 10% of our members of the Icelandic Writers' Union do not have income from other work than writing. They are the teachers, the taxi drivers, the fishermen, shop attendants, scholars, and all the others who write for us and are a big part of the immensely strong market which Icelandic literature forms. It goes without saying that Iceland is a tiny market and our language is spoken and understood by just about 350,000 people. On the other hand, our literary tradition is very deeply rooted and despite our small population, we publish around 1,800 titles per year or what corresponds to one published title for every 200 inhabitants. That's not counting all the theater plays, teleplays, screenplays, and all the other forms of literature our colleagues in Iceland create. We Icelanders are known to hold a world record in everything per capita. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not claiming that we also hold world record in, in book publication, but those who are interested can whip out their calculators and compute what one title per year for every 200 inhabitants would mean among nations counting tens or even hundreds of millions. <laughs> Given these facts, you might assume that Icelandic writers were respected and well off as a group. That is exactly where the contradiction comes in. When the COVID-19 epidemic crashed from Icelandic society, as it did everywhere else, it became obvious that artists don't fit very well into the welfare system, which is meant to catch those who, for whatever reason, cannot make a living for a period of time. The fact is that the system in question does not understand the conditions of those who have irregular income and need to work various jobs to make ends meet. This is what caused extreme problems for artists when they were forced to postpone their operations, their art shows, their theater shows, their public readings, etc., and did not, as it turned out, have any real rights to unemployment compensations. If I'm not mistaken, there is a group of people in here that can communicate their own experience and tell us how other countries handle corresponding situations. It would be valuable for us to hear about their experience afterwards. It is one of RSI's ambitions to promote more respect for the work and role of writers, which encompasses, among other things, that our jobs be considered real work that is worth the right compensation and that we enjoy the same rights as other members of society. When I speak of real work, I mean that writers' wages should not merely be a portion of median wages, but something that can be considered a full salary every month of the year. The group that is getting artist stipends and is enabled to make writing their profession also needs to grow considerably. Grow way above the 10% that make ends meet as it is though fun, through funds and book sales on a tight market. Speaking of which, let us look briefly on the part that book sales play in the author's situation. The development in this field has been quite similar to what has happened in other countries when it comes to the gap between bestsellers and books that enjoy medium sales or less. A few decades ago, it was considered a fantastic result for a title to sell in 
6,000 to 7,000 copies in the Icelandic market. Huge numbers. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it was quite acceptable for an author's first publication to sell 1,800 copies or so. Nowadays, this divide has broadened considerably. Bestsellers can now achieve sales of up to 10,000 copies in the year of publication, but the lower figure has, on the other hand, dropped to 600 to 800 copies. And we still must keep in mind that the market is tiny, but understandably, this has affected immensely the livelihood of the writers who are on the market. A handful of writers, perhaps four or five, have a nice income from the sales of their books. The relatively low percentage of each copy sold, that is their share. But the other book, the one who only sells 700 copies, has grown immensely. That is, of course, the group that has to depend on other sources of income beside book sales to make a living. As a micro market, we need to defend our copyright to the nail as do larger markets around us. We're all aware of the tendency of publishers to degrade the author's rights when their creations are bought for publication or other kinds of production. The so-called buyout policy, where producers in power of money preempt the ideas and creations of artists as in our view, is in our view, entirely unacceptable. In our country, like in the rest of the world, Wealthy and multinational corporations pursue this kind of business and thereby degrade the creation of the human spirit with their content. As a result, we have multiple examples of artists who do not profit from the success their work enjoys. As a union, we consider it one of our fundamental duties to defend the writer's copyright, both in a wide and narrow context. However, if we look at the respect that literature enjoys in Iceland, apart from the writer's financial situation, we see a very pleasant picture. The reading of books is very rife in our country, sales of books is good, and libraries are thriving, which all bears witness to Iceland's great respect for literature and their awareness of its importance. A language like Icelandic, with, with its very limited distribution, is in desperate need for literature to save it from extinction, to save it from drowning in the sea of other and stronger languages all around us, languages that are dominating in powerful media, which have become the strongest influential forces in the Earth's societies. That is exactly the reason why it is an urgent concern of the Icelandic state, the Icelandic nation and Icelandic nationality that Icelandic writers are unable to do their job with dignity and progress. Dear colleagues, I sincerely hope that some of what's been said here has awakened thought and perhaps questions worth considering amongst us. It is of great value for artists to have a conversation about their situation and the importance of the work that they do. It may not always be obvious, but it is my conviction that creative thought, which appears in writers and other artists' works, is one of the things which heals our societies, <coughs> especially after the blows our world has received, either by human behavior or the workings of natural forces. They are the times in which the human spirit needs culture and art the most, which gives us courage and reminds us of the values that lift us up from our everyday strife, lighten our moods, inspire our variable emotions, lend us wings. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's extremely inspiring. Now, a, a lot. Get a copy of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's see. We'll see if I copyright things. A lot of what you talked about sounded familiar to Canadian ears uh, in terms of you know support and and the importance of the national literature and, and and everything. Even though we talked about the difference in the size of the markets, but I've written down here. Um, artistic salaries from the state for up to two years and beside it I have the mind-blowing emoji going off um, because I just cannot imagine that uh, that that does not exist in in any other territory that I'm aware of uh, that's uh, that's fascinating but only 10 percent is what you're saying yeah yes yeah and and and, and the, the, the group that is re receiving a two-year salary is, is time is maybe what four people Thank you. No, nobody has at this time. Nobody has this time. No, no. Uh, right. but that it's 10 to 12 a year. Yeah, one, one year. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, only oh, 10, okay. 10 to 12 authors? Yes. 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 Oh, so it's All not very many. Uh -huh. yeah. Then there's a. Uh, do you have an yeah. Yeah. Yes, Margaret is going to get to Margaret, uh, so you, you write for both children and adults, is that correct? Yeah. Tell us about the children's market. Is that even uh, more difficult? Yes, I think ah, so. Okay. But I actually had to speak more so. Do you want me to read absolutely. the question that I just talked about? No, absolutely. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. I'll do and that. I'm sure there's questions uh, online as well. So. Sure. Okay. I'll just start. Okay. I, we did. I did slides because I nice. didn't know the setup. This is actually my nieces, but uh, <laughs> well. Uh, uh, first, a little bit about me because my background is quite uh, different from most writers uh, of children's literature. My name is Margaret Tripodotti, just like you said, and I'm, I write books for children. I've written one autobiography of my time in politics. And uh, I have written a young adult novel and various articles, many about literature, culture, or politics. I have worked in various roles in the world of literature and books since last century. So well, this is not me, but <laughs> <laughs> the century before that. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, I've been a literary critic, teacher of literature, editor, translator, assistant of a CEO of a publishing house I worked for, and of course a writer. And then I was a member of parliament uh, from 2009 to 2013 in the aftermath month of the economic collapse. And right now I'm working on a book for children about art and another novel for young adults. And I'm, I'm also a board member here at the Writers' ah. Union of Iceland. Well, um, but that was not asked here to comment on me. <laughs> <That's my support. laughs> I, I, and I will reflect on what it's like to be a writer in Iceland. Is it really possible to live and prosper writing books in Icelandic? Well, lucky me being a writer in Iceland, the land of literature, which you saw earlier <laughs> in the 19th century photo there. Uh, we have a grand tradition of writers, as Kali said, uh, the sagas and all kinds of literature through the ages it must be great. And all of us uh, writing all kinds of books must be very much appreciated. Well, spoiler alert, we are not. Mm. After working in various jobs in publishing, and then after being a politician in difficult times after the economic crash, when we were trying to do as much as we could for as little money as possible, it became very, I became very interested in how systems work as a chain and how one link in the chain can affect all the other. If, not, if one factor is not working, the whole system is affected and can be dysfunctional. Well, after I had done my time in Parliament, I wanted to return to my career in the world of books, but now, uh, not just as an editor, but as a writer. But was it possible? Before the economic crash, my life seems to revolve around this event more than 10 years ago. I was working for a publishing house and then as a freelance editor, and it was fine. Every once in a while I wrote books for children, not very long ones. I think my record is 30 minutes from getting an idea to writing a book that took my co-author weeks to illustrate. 
And uh, we even got an award that gave us some nice mon sum of money, so it wasn't so bad. I could occasionally write books that would pay for my family's summer holidays, for example. But now I just wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be my sole profession, and my main interest is writing books for children and teenagers, Icelandic children. And to be honest, there are not so many. The Icelandic Bureau of Statistics tells us that every year between four to 5,000 children are born in Iceland. So if I wanted to write a book for children that uh, recently started to read, six-year-olds, I would have to market, I, have a, I would have a market uh, of about 5,000 children. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And since our wonderful uh, tradition of Yola Book of Flow, uh, publishing most of the books in the autumn and try to sell them as Christmas presents, we only have about three months to sell the book. Of course, there are bookstores open all year round, and, uh, but most of the books are sold two weeks for Chris before Christmas. In any other market, selling uh, a specific product to 10% of your focus group is pretty good. Here, it would only be about 500 books. Mm -hmm. And you cannot even take a family of four on a decent holiday for that, for the royalties of that. Uh, I already knew the numbers and that it was hard to thrive as a writer for small, for small uh, sector within a micro market. I was also very worried about the children of Iceland and declining literacy. The book is, fast, is facing enormous competition from computers, all kinds of digital entertainments and media, and so much of this is free. Don't get me wrong, I like computers and I'm not afraid of the future in general, but almost all of this is in English. A large part of children's mm. lives, their games and interests and many things are only available to them in English. And we have, for example, wonderful names for the stars in Icelandic and other aspects of the astronomy in Icelandic. But many children only know those names in English because all kinds of apps and websites are the gateway to the wonders of the galaxy. A small nation as Iceland can never make sufficient amounts of movies for children to see or Icelandic apps, websites, or computer games to fulfill the demand. But we can write and publish enough Icelandic books for our children to read and translate other ones. Our children have uh, the right to stories that reflect on their origin and their present as well. They have a right to books about them, and a story about the world can also be a non-fiction book. If we can't give them that, then we are telling them that their lives is not important enough to be a story, and that's horrible. So that's not a message I want to send to our young generation. So after being inside the system of power, not that I had any actual active power <laughs> myself as a member of parliament, I wanted to find ways to ensure that uh, we could have an active group of professional writers and, uh, for children, because it matters that people can be full-time writers. Uh, I think that if you want to be good at something, really good, it cannot be a part-time job or a hobby. I have to be, you have to be able to be a full-time writer to be, develop your skills and to be really good. To me, it is pretty obvious that the market in Iceland will not enable children's writers to live and prosper. We need public support. So in 2006, Seven, I did the research of uh, public support for writers, especially children's writers and publishers in Iceland, and compared it to Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Uh, it will not take me long to sum up the public support for Icelandic children's writers and other writers as well. First, what we do very well, and Kali told you about earlier, the writers' salaries. And Every year, the state grants 555 uh, months to artist salaries to writers. 
So that's a lot. Can you repeat that? 555 months. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, the, there are, of course, all kinds of artists who get this, but this is just for the writers. And the biggest lot of, of the uh, artist salaries go to writers, actually. Uh, it's technically can be to, up to two years, but nobody has gotten that for a number of years. So it's either three, six, nine, or 10, 12 months that each one get. The funding is decided uh, by the yearly budget of the parliament. Even though we call it a salary, it's, it really is not. The artists are pays, paid as contractors. So um, from the approximately 490 Icelandic krona that is paid per month, uh, the artists have to pay taxes, of course, just like any other. And uh, he uh, also has to pay some uh, weights related expenses, pension funds and such. So it equals at, at uh, like 350,000 Icelandic kronas, which is actually the minimum weight, I think, mm -hmm. now. And uh, it's the equivalent of 2,700 US dollars or 240,000, you no, know, 2,400 euros. So um, this year, uh, 12 artists got 12 months, 20 artists got nine months. Uh, 22 got six months and 21 writers got three months. Um, it's, it is difficult to assume how many children's writers got artistic salary every year because the applications are protected mm. uh, and you, know, you never know what kind of projects people are applying for. You just know what they've written before, but uh, they might want to write something else. <laughs> Maybe for a smaller, a bigger market even. <laughs> um, but uh, even though the amount after taxes that is paid out monthly uh, uh, is a little bit under the minimal wages after taxes and everything, uh, this system has made it possible for Icelandic writers to become professional writers. It's pretty hard and not so many writers get the grants but per capita, more writers do than in similar systems in, in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. And uh, I think uh, the application, it's like 17% of people that apply that get. So it's a lot of people don't get this, mm -hmm. <laughs> apparently. Um, the other big fund is the library fund. And recently, government has been making it bigger. So up to 147 Icelandic krona was paid out last year for every book that was sent out in public and school libraries last year. All the Nordic countries do this and the amount for each book is not so far from other countries, but again, with so few users, the payments are limited. Still many writers and translators of literature for children get more money from this fund than from selling the books. Mm -hmm. um, unlike many other countries, reading or talking about uh, books and children is not a big income cost. Schools tend to think that getting authors to read from their books in schools is a good advertisement for them and should not be paid for. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of popular writers do that in hope of selling more books. And while uh, that goes on, there is little hope to change this attitude. Other public uh, support is almost just for literary prizes and awards and sometimes grants dedicated for specific purposes. All the wonderful staff here in Gunnarsvås at the Writers' Union uh, have also reached, uh, researched this field. In their study, they have actual figures from actual writers. The figures are calculated from sales, library funds, and readings. Uh, the writers' juniors also run an online survey uh, among writers. This was done in 2018. So the numbers might be a little bit higher now because of inflation. Mm -hmm. But I uh, decided not to update them, and I'm sure that you will get the idea. So 
Uh, I told you about the minimum wages, but in, in uh, 2018, it was like 300,000. So everything is a little bit higher. Uh, the average wages at that time was about 670,000. Uh, so about this survey or study, we have a few interna Icelandic internationally known writers of crime novels. And their books sell intracloats in many countries. And this survey, we are not talking about them. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not talking about people. We are talking uh, not pe talking about people like me ten years ago who only had who had a J job and uh, wrote an occasional book every once in a while. We are just talking about professional writers, well known and popular in our country. Some of them have written bestsellers over the years, and we are mainly talking about writers of fiction. So every year, uh, only about 10 to 15 uh, Icelandic novels are sold in more than 800 copies. The average sale is well under 1,000 copies for a novel. For each copy, the author gets a profit well, approximately 850 kroners, which is like 6.5 US dollars for a proper hardcover book. So for 1,000 copies, the author gets 850,000 uh, Icelandic kroners, the equivalent of 6,500 US dollars. And sometimes it takes three years to write a novel, as you <laughs> probably know. Um, Many Icelandic authors are translated abroad, and maybe it's those Icelandic novels that are bringing all the tourists to Iceland. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I know that they inspire and influence the, read the readers as well as all good novels do. Many people think that authors get rich from this, and those crime, novel crime novelists I mentioned earlier actually have, like all three or four of them. Uh, the average writers don't get rich. Uh, standard advance payment is like 200,000 Icelandic kroners, which is like $1,500. And in many cases, that's all the writer ever gets. It's uh, a lot of fun to get your book published in another language, but it will not make you rich and hardly pay for your holiday unless you spend it all in a small cottage somewhere close to home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, two to four uh, Icelandic authors, again, not the crime uh, mm -hmm. writers, got more than 700,000 to 1,500,000 uh, Icelandic kroners a year, or five to 10,000 uh, US dollars a year. Good for them. And then uh, the library fund, it's actually recently got quite higher than in 2018 when we did this, so it's a little bit better. Yes. Uh, uh, in 2018, popular authors got about 200 to 350,000 Icelandic kroners a year from the fund. Uh, but now it's a little bit, it might even get you to Spain. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Writers' Union estimated that each author gets about uh, 50 to 150 kroners a year for reading in various locations, giving talks and lectures. And then the real people behind these pictures. We have a chart, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but I had some... Uh, uh, well, okay. I think it's one back. Yeah, analysis. yeah. Uh, or maybe I don't really have it. It doesn't really. That's matter. the one. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are actual writers and their income in 2013 to 2017. And how many books, uh, their age, um, how many years they've been writing and their sex. And you can see that the uh, wages they are getting, it's not very much. So the average is uh, 320,000 uh, a year, uh, which is like, uh, if, if you convert it to wages, it's uh, 233,000, which is well under the minimal rate, which is in Iceland. Um, so uh, the average monthly payment, yeah. 
And uh, then the next slide, please. Okay, so here we have a slide with two popular novelists, and this is their yearly income in 2030 to 2017. So the first one, you can see exactly how much he got. He was actually quite lucky because he got artist salaries for first uh, for the first two years. He got mm -hmm. for four years, so he was, you know, he had he could buy some milk for his children. And then he got some money from the library uh, uh, and then, you know, sold some book and, and had some foreign sales as well. It is not much. Uh, so, and the other one, uh, he has actually had uh, artist salary for 12 months the whole time. So these are our top writers, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, they get about... Uh, 5 million 300,000 kroners a year, which makes about uh, 442,000 a month or 3,300 US dollars. And these are, like uh, I said, our top um, artists and, and then the writers who write for small people. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next uh, slide, please. Um, these are writers for children, actual writers. And as you can see, they don't get as much artist salary as the hmm. writers for grown-ups. So uh, the first one, he has uh, gotten once, three months, and then the other two years, six months. And you can also see that uh, he's, well, this one is not getting that much from the library fund, and he's not getting much of royalties, and uh, but in 2015, he had the best seller. So you can see that he's only getting, well, he's getting uh, less than half of what the, the writers for adults mm -hmm. are getting. Mm -hmm. And the, the other one, uh, actually, he has no luck with the artist's salary, but as you can see, it's a popular writer. So he's getting quite a lot from the library fund. A lot of people are reading his work, but it's probably not uh, artistic enough. And you can see he had the bestseller in 2014, but other than that, he's not getting very much. And he is just getting a fraction, like 20% of what the, the adult um, uh, writers are getting. But, well, the times are changing. And we are getting now more from the library fund. We can actually, I think, double these figures. Yes, yeah, yeah today <clears throat> from 2017, I uh, mean. Uh, so, uh, but we also have a system now uh, that we didn't have at this time that uh, <laughs> is for the publishers. So the publishers get a, a huge <laughs> refund for every krona they spent on. Um, working on a book or marketing it, they get the quarter back. So uh, mm. the, they actually also get uh, some money, some refund uh, from what they pay the authors. And they will have agreed to give us 45% of that. So <laughs> they're actually making money of what they are supposed to pay us or what they have been paying us. So. Of course, it's very good for writers that their publishers don't get bankrupt, but uh, I think uh, there is a better way to use this money for creation. So, well, and I have a great sympathy for uh, Icelandic publishers because I know it's a tough business. I've been there, um, but we are trying to save our language and to get people, especially children, to read and uh, to me, this action is like having a patient that has been hit by a car and is severely injured and you only fix one of his broken legs. Mm -hmm. um, but however, we continue to write to, and children and people, other people, they continue to read. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I've had a sense since before I came here, that there was deep respect for books and writing uh, within Iceland. And 
I even found a little bar down in downtown Reykjavik that's all books and uh, just fascinated by by this culture. But I didn't know the uh, I didn't know the numbers that, that that you were talking about. So I have a couple of questions. First of all, I noticed that one of the children's writers you mentioned um, had no foreign sales. Mm -hmm. So what, like, what are the odds of getting translated and then getting outside of the border? For writers of children? Sure. Uh, okay, I think, well, there, isn't, there are not so many of them. And uh, I have, like, one of my book has been translated to Italy, but I don't think it has, you know, really been sold there. But uh, uh, there are a few. But uh, even the most popular Icelandic writers for children, they are not really popular anywhere else. They they are just lucky, and you know it's a lot of fun. You put the Facebook something <laughs> for an yeah, edition, yeah. and then you know you you never heard you never hear from it again. You don't really make any money out of it or, or make a living out of it. But maybe it mm -hmm. keeps you going. But yeah. So no wonder you guys all do so much, so many different jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we try to make right. a living. <laughs> yeah. um, have you lobbied the government for more funding? For That's what we do all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 That's, That's our, actually our main, our main purpose. I yeah. 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 That's our task. We, we do it. Uh, it we uh, very lucky, like I think we said earlier today, that we have a, 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 a sort of culture at this time that mm -hmm. is really friendly towards the arts and, and literature. Yeah. So, uh, so we try to take advantage of that. And it, 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 we look upon that as, as our main task to, to you know, advance the, the system of stipends and, and, and all that, get, get, them, get more months, get, get a higher salaries and so forth. Excellent. Danasis, do we have questions online? We have one. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so someone online has a question for our panel. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Marcelo Arrieri from the Argentine Writers Union. First of all, I want to thank you all for this meeting. It's the first meeting we, we attend. And I want to tell that the it's very inspiring, the, the work of the Icelandic writers. We got in contact with you one year ago, asking about the, the writer's salary. We knew about it, and it's some kind of idea we, we brought to an institution we are trying to, to get here in Argentina. It's um, the writers, it's the Book Institute, a uh, law that we are uh, trying to, to get. And, and the idea of the, the writer salary and the public uh, library rights are public lending rights are things that we are getting in the discussion in this moment. So I wanted to thank you all for this inspiring uh, uh, talks. And I want to make a, a kind petition for the, the secretariat and the organization that if it could be possible next time to have a, a translation at the same time for Spanish speakers and a brief information of those videos that were great that we could bring to our associates and the public authorities, that it's a powerful uh, tool for us. So if it could be translated also to Spanish it would be very good. And we lose, we lose the shows too, and that's, more important. We see all of you laughing, and we know why. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very pleased to, to attend to this meeting. Great suggestions. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions online? Nothing? I have a question. You mentioned the uh, book flood. I can't say it in Icelandic. <laughs> yes. I was explaining it to colleagues at, at lunch. Could you give us a little uh, overview. Uh, yeah, uh, this has actually historical reasons uh, because we were such a, well, I don't know what to call it, a very strange country, primitive. <laughs> primitive country, and we had all kinds of import uh, taxes and restrictions, but uh, there were no uh, restrictions on books because they were actually printed here. 
it was sometimes very difficult to get paper though, but somehow they managed. So uh, the book became a very popular gift uh, for Christmas uh, uh, after, well, the Second World War. Yeah. Or, uh, that was when we first saw any money here. So uh, it was, you know, in a, in a time where you could, you had a lot of money, but you couldn't buy anything because they were not importing things and they were always trying to save our little fragile currency. But then you had a lot of books. So it was, you know, very good. And it became a tradition, a, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, you know, Christmas was about books yeah. in Iceland. And, and, and reading and, and you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a time, it's a very good time from October to Christmas time uh, when you have a lot of, you know, parties and uh, readings and you know, talk in, in media about books. So it is very energetic for our uh, culture and industry, but then you have a lot of sorry, <laughs> Uh, stressed out writers in January when nobody <laughs> talks about them and nobody is reading their books anymore and they, yeah. and maybe nobody you know when we when we get everything at the same time uh, we sometimes books and authors get a little bit lost yeah, in yeah. this flow so it's actually it's very good for the bestsellers and but sometimes other authors are getting lost but we try to. Sure. Find late ways to. And also, it's a, it's a kind of a. Well, when I was a kid, uh, for some reason, we in Iceland we open our uh, presents on on Christmas Eve, not mm -hmm. on, on Christmas Day. So I, I, we would get, like me and my sisters would get, you know, a pile of books for for Christmas, and then we would start reading right away. So we spent all of you know Christmas night reading books, and, and that, that's how it is or was at least in, in very many households. So that's uh, my romantic vision of, of my uh, childhood Christmas. It's lovely. So even in economic times when other gifts are available, you, know, you can go to the shopping mall and get whatever. It's, there's still this tradition that that you you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get a book yeah 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 if not more than one book yeah, yeah. And, and you know it's like the grandmothers they take care of everyone is getting at least one book so. sure. yeah. <laughs> we need a law like that <laughs> <laughs> let's get to work on that but it's actually i think it's quite beautiful uh, actually for kids that you know that you get to own a book and it's just not yeah. something you just yeah. land or in the library, get in the library, but you actually get your own collection of books and you can, you know, put them in, the, in your room and stuff. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, we went over a little bit, but uh, that's okay. It was a very, very full day. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming all the way to Iceland, just for me. <laughs> it was very nice of you. And uh, thank you to everyone online, but mostly thank you to uh, to the Writers Union of uh, of Iceland for hosting. This has been uh, fantastic, yeah, and uh, a wonderful full day. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We are officially adjourned. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>